You may know that I had the experience of losing three family members to death this last year. My mother in April, my sister in August, and my brother in December. Death is not foreign to me. And even before this year happened, I spent 18 years as a hospital chaplain where I pretty much have seen everything. I have sat by many a bedside while people struggled with horrible prognoses and where people watched their loved ones die. I've spent hours in emergency rooms next to people waiting to find out if their loved ones survived the horrible accident they were just in. This human condition of pain and suffering and death is something I know. And I'm here to tell you today that in this story, I don't think John, the author of this gospel, has any idea what he's talking about. Because if you've ever been in any of those kinds of situations, and I'm confident that you have been, to suggest that Mary and Martha were simply disappointed when Jesus didn't show up sounds ridiculous to me. That after they had sent word to him that Lazarus was dying, believing completely and fully that God and in Jesus could do anything that Jesus wanted, that God and Jesus could cure him because they had seen it happen to other people and they knew that Jesus loved Lazarus and then to not have him show up reeks of something much stronger to me than disappointment. They say to Jesus when he finally shows up four days too late, if you had been here, this would not have happened. All those words we may not have said it quite like that. Maybe it was more like, why, God, would you let this happen? Or, God can heal me if God wants to. I just don't know why God doesn't want me. Those words that we say in our pleading when we are filled with this much pain and sorrow because we desperately want to believe in a God who is so powerful that God will intervene on our behalf in the way that we want God to intervene on our behalf. We want to believe in this God who will take control of the situations when we feel completely and utterly out of control. And I imagine, not much of an imagination actually, it's not much of a leap, to know that it would have simply been easier if Jesus had shown up when they asked him to. If he had immediately responded and he had come to Bethany and he had laid his hands on Lazarus and all of his pain and suffering would have been completely avoided. But Jesus isn't, wasn't then and still isn't interested in the easy thing. Instead, Jesus does one of the things that I think is the most difficult is that he goes to them, he goes to Mary and Martha, his friends, and he sits with them in their grief. Now, if you have ever been the person who was asked to sit with a friend while they watched their loved one die, or to sit with a friend while they waited for that bad diagnosis, or to sit with someone after they just heard it, to get the call from a friend that she discovered that her spouse is cheating on her, all of those things, you know how hard it is to sit in that space of pain and agony and suffering with another human being. And if you've been that human being, in that kind of pain, you know how amazingly healing it is to have someone who will simply sit with you, who won't pretend that they can fix it, who won't offer empty words of hope, but will just be with you in your pain. And that is the road that Jesus takes here. Because Jesus isn't interested in the shortcut. 
Jesus doesn't shortcut his own pain and his own grief. John tells us beautifully in those simple statement that Jesus weeps. John gives us all sorts of reason to believe that Jesus has that full experience of grief and sorrow and loss. Because the incarnate God, the God that is with us, in us, as us, has no interest in helping us bypass the human experience. Jesus was not interested in not having that experience for himself, and he did not desire to save anyone else from it either. Because the incarnate God did not come to save us from being human, to pull us out of the depths of the darkness that sometimes is the human condition. This God comes to us in the middle of it and sits down next to us. The God that Jesus preaches to us is a God that longs for our healing and our wholeness more than any other thing. And Jesus calls us towards that over and over and over again. Just like Lazarus, Jesus calls us by name and invites us to step out of all of that pain to move through, not around, but through all of that suffering to the hope and the promise and the resurrection that is ours on the other side. And yet, even after Jesus calls his name and Lazarus comes out of the tomb, Lazarus is still bound by death. He, the, 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 the burial cloths of death still cling to him. He's still not completely free. And again, Jesus doesn't save him then either. He turns to the community and he says, unbind him. Because this journey that we have towards God in the middle of our humanity is not a journey that we take on our own no matter how much we want to. We need each other to help us not only hear that voice of God, but then as we're coming through the darkness in those times, to have someone who will help us find the light, who will unbind us, who will help free us from the pain. That's what this community is meant to do in the world. Jesus calls Lazarus by name and he responds. Jesus calls us by name and invites us to do the same. And this cycle of death and rebirth is around us all the time, constantly. It's everywhere. It is how creation is put together. The sun rises and it sets. Winter gives way to spring. A grandparent dies and a grandchild is born. This is how creation moves. And this is how God moves in it. There are many truths inside this story today. One that I think is important is this thing that Jesus says about himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Please hear that carefully. Jesus does not say, I used to be or I will be the presence of Jesus in that moment is the same Jesus present in this moment. I am. Which means that the resurrection, the life, and the restoration that Jesus offers to Lazarus and offers to us is not something meant for later. It's not something meant for after we die. It's meant for right now. I am. Jesus reminds us. The truth is that God really does create beautiful things out of dust. That God really does make goodness out of destruction. Because this is who God is. So much so that there is nothing so dead that Jesus can't bring it to life. 
whether that thing is in us or out there. And there's a caution in the story for us, too. Because at the beginning, the disciples are very clear they do not want Jesus to go to Bethany. They are so obsessed with the situational limitation in front of them, the fear that something bad will happen, the sense that going to Bethany feels like going backwards, all of these things they worry about that, are, that come from a mindset of limitation and uncertainty and fear, you'll notice that they disappear from the story completely. That by the time Jesus gets to Bethany, we don't even hear about them anymore. Because with that kind of a, of a mindset of being so concerned about all the reasons why this is impossible, they can't experience it. And so we have to be careful in our lives and how we function together as a faith community that we don't let our own sense of what is not possible, our own fear, our own limitations, keep us from experiencing the full restoration and new life that God is offering to us again and again and again and again. Because if we stay there, we will never make it to Bethany. We will never experience the fullness and the promise of resurrection and new life and new beginnings and new hope. We will be left out of the story completely. So listen. That's all we're asked to do, is to listen to the voice, listen for the voice, whether it comes loudly or whether it comes in that silent whisper we can barely hear. Listen. Because God is calling you. God is calling all of us to step out of all the things that enslave us and entomb us and keep us dark guiding us into new hope and new possibilities. And all we have to do 